I'm in the NIV, so you may have a different version. If you do, use it or use a pew Bible. By the way, tonight we're going to talk about the unforgivable sin. So if that's something you've struggled with, you might want to come out tonight. That's a very important text in Gospel of Mark. But right now, Romans 14. Working our way through Romans, we're already in chapter 14. And last time, we talked about opposite opinions. People with differing opinions, Christians, on disputable matters. Uh, if you have the NIV, Romans 14, 1, accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. Uh, King James, doubtful disputations. We're not talking about the major issues, but the minors. And I dare say that Satan likes to major on minors. Satan loves to get into the small things of our lives and split us apart, both in terms of families, husbands and wives, and in the church between Christians. He loves to get us arguing about little, tiny, minute points that may have very little value or importance in terms of the ongoing work of Christ and the work of the kingdom of God. He loves to put us at odds with one another. And so we're going to title this Avoiding Offense, Offending Other People. Um, last time, it was very related last time. We were in verses 1 to 12 last time. Accept the weaker brother or sister. Leave the judging to God. Understand the principle of individual accountability. And we'll be talking about principles today. The idea that we're individually accountable before God. And we have certain freedoms before God, but our freedoms are not to impinge upon the freedoms of others. Now, what is an offense? Something that causes a person to be hurt or to be angry or to be upset. We're trying to avoid that in the church. We're trying to keep the unity of the spirit. And you know as well as I that it's easy, don't you, to offend other people. Sometimes it's something you said. Sometimes it's not what you said, but it's the way you said it. Sometimes it's the very look in your eye. Uh, can offend people, uh, things that we do that they don't like, that they don't feel is right, actions that we took that we feel were, that they feel were against them and maybe were never intended to be, but they took offense by it. So consider those thoughts as we look at Romans 14, beginning in verse 13. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. Verse 14, Paul says, As one who is in the Lord, Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Of course, the running illustration is on food, particularly food sacrificed to idols. But we know there's a deeper application here. Verse 16, do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. Let's reflect on that verse a minute. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Therefore, let us, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification, building up of one another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. And I have seen that happen. We'll get to that. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything, anything else that will cause your brother to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, I like this verse, whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. <laughs> Don't get into it with other people, seems to say. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. You've got to think about that one. I like the NIV on this whole text. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith. And how about this? And everything that does not come from faith is sin. Wow, what a verse that is. I think you'd do a whole sermon just on that alone. Uh, we don't have the same issue that Paul and the church had, the early church was eating meat, sacrificed to idols, and whether or not that was right. And some Christians had, you know, they really hesitated to do that. They felt that that was immoral. They didn't want to eat anything that had been sacrificed. Other Christians are saying, hey, you know, there's no such thing as an idol anyway. There's only one true God. Why not eat it? 
and different views. And you can kind of see both sides. We don't have that same issue today, but we have the principles. To, we have so much we can glean from in terms of the principles here. And I'm going to give you three of them. The way I look at this, I think principles are a good way to put the outline. And the first principle that Paul gives us here is the principle of loving surrender, I'll call it. Of loving surrender. The surrender of your right to express your point of view or to live out your faith in the way that you feel you should or can or have a right to, the surrender of that because you're in the company of other people who have different views. And so you lay down your right to do that or to say that, to express your opinion even. In the interest of unity, you clam up. <laughs> now these are only, again, it's only about doubtful matters, questionable matters, not major issues. And we had talked last time, I, I gave you a list, here's a few. For example, these are the ones I listed last week. Some, sometimes, at least, you might want to not express your views, right? On politics, different views on tithing can be divisive. Alcohol, certainly a major issue. Smoking, even. Uh, music can be a divisive issue. Different views on it. Uh, even healing tongues, the gifts of the spirit. Uh, divorce and remarriage. Uh, other things, even missions I had mentioned last time. People have different views on it, what we ought to be doing in terms of missile. Those are just a few issues. There's more we'll run into here as we go along. There's a lot of issues that cause tension, and, and a lot of times I think you can discuss them. I, I remember going to Bible college, and we had to carpool to South Portland, Maine. It was over an hour's drive each way, and, and we, would, you know, we would just go back and forth on a lot of these issues about whether it was right for a Christian and what, was, what did God's word say. And, and you know, we would say to each other, okay, that's your view. Where's the chapter and verse to defend it? If that's what you want to say about it, then give me a verse. And we would love that. We would love the banter. So, I mean, I think there's a place for that. You've got to just be sure who you're with. Because it's very easy to offend people when you're strong in your opinions, like I am sometimes. Amen? And you may be as well. But the principle of loving surrender, verse 13, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block, any occasion to fall or obstacle in your brother or your sister's way, right? And we talked, I think, Wednesday night about a body piercing for as an example. Let's take tattoos for today, right? Are tattoos wrong for the Christian? You know, if you express a strong view on that and there's a tattooed Christian present, you're probably going to offend them, right? And you can't always see that they have a tattoo because it could be underneath their clothing, right? So if you're too strong in that, it's very easy to see how there becomes a division between you and that brother or sister. And maybe they got the tattoo before they were saved anyway, right? It may not be an issue at all, or maybe it is. Maybe you have different views. Maybe you can find a verse in the Old Testament that speaks something about marking the body. There are a couple. Uh, but the work of God is by far more important, the unity of the church, than your view on that minor matter versus somebody else's. You see? That's the kind of thing we're talking about here. Loving surrender, the principle of surrendering your point of view and not making an issue about it, not dealing with it, not talking about it, even to the point where you might say to them, nice tattoo. And you're thinking, I'd never do that. <laughs> I don't want that on my body. But you're trying to bring unity to the body. And maybe you disagree with me on this, but hey, what's the principle? Loving surrender. You're surrendering to my view on this. Uh, so Paul goes on, look at verse 15, this will bring it out a little better. If your brother is distressed or grieved because of what you eat, or maybe other things, right? What you drink, or what you say, or what your views are, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. But let's talk about eating a little bit. Now my wife knows that I love dessert. And if I had my way, I would, would have dessert after every meal, including breakfast. There's always room for a donut after a bowl of cereal, right? But if I go to a restaurant with a group of people and nobody else is ordering dessert, I try not to order dessert. Because I know people are on diets and people are trying to eat right and I might be distressing them, I might be offending them, I might be tempting them. Plus I don't want, I want to give away a bite anyway, right? <laughs> No, but I, so I don't, I, I would order a dessert myself. Of course, there's also the price, right? They get so much money for desserts in restaurants. It's a good reason not to order them. But I don't want to offend other people. You see, that, that's the idea of surrendering. 
lovingly surrendering to the group that you're with or to the people that you're with, your own view, your own opinion. Um, you know, and here's a controversial one. Paul wrote to Timothy, Stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. 1 Timothy 5, 23. Well, does that verse give permission to the Christian to drink wine? You may say yes. You may say no. But one thing we know is you should not drink, if you believe that it gives you permission to drink, in the presence of a brother or sister who believes that that's wrong. And they've got scripture to back up their point of view. Amen? And on that issue, you can find scriptures both sides. So what we have to be very careful of is not splitting the church over this issue. Each person has a right to their own opinion, even though you're sure you're right. <laughs> right? Uh, by the way, that, that verse is about medicinal use, right? Medicinal. <laughs> It's medicinal, right? Verse 16, do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. I like this. I got a quote here. And that's a great verse, isn't it? Do you get what he's saying in verse 16? Do not allow what you consider fine and okay and good, not a sin to you. You don't want me saying that you've got a sin in your life, right? So don't even tell me about it. Right? I don't want to know. See, some people don't want to know about it because we don't want it to come between us. Uh, you may be exploring, you're talking to other people to find out what they view about certain things. And, and I think, you know, the, it's like common sense here. Know when not to push it. But John MacArthur this week was talking about this matter. And I like this little quote. He says, you know you are free when you are free not to use your freedom. Amen. You know you're truly free when you're free not to use your freedom. You know you're truly free in Christ when you can lay down your own freedom, when you can sacrifice your own freedom, and we can, when you can understand that other people do have different points of view, you respect them for it. And we should respect them for their views, as long as they got them from God himself in God's word, not from personal opinion, right? We have to, again, chapter and verse. You want to defend that? Okay, I want to see the verses. I want to, you should know where they are, because you know it's a controversial issue. And you must have studied the verses out that give you the permission to do whatever or to say whatever. Certain words in our language today, are they swear words or not? Well, we have to decide, what, are we going to include those words in our language or not? And I, I think sometimes we do include words that are borderline. We're better off to err on the side of being careful in the words we use, don't you think? But it's awful easy in this culture. But if somebody uses that word in your presence and you're thinking, no, nah, to me that's a swear word. But we're not going to jump all over them, right? Because they used it. Because they stand before God themselves. Verse 17. I like this verse here, too. The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. That's not the issue. What somebody accepts for food or drink. The kingdom of God is about righteousness, about peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Again, the devil's in the details. It's the principle of loving surrender, laying down our rights, because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Number two. So that's the principle of loving surrender. Makes sense, doesn't it? You've got to lay down your rights. You have the right, right? You do. If you see no problem with tattoos, under God, you have the right and the freedom to go out and get one. God bless you for it. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> you know? But it's fine. It's because you have... And, and, and we'll get to that a little bit more with our third principle here in just a moment, so hang on. But number two, the principle of mutual edification. And that's exactly the words he uses in verse 19 in the NIV. Mutual edification. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and a mutual edification or the building up of one another, New American Standard. A little more literal probably there. We could Maybe, maybe it would be better to say um, reciprocal edification. We each want to edify the other. So reciprocal is almost better than mutual edification. But this principle, and by the way, great for marriages here, right? The principle of mutual edification, <laughs> doing what you can to build one another up and to bless one another and to help one another and to be there for each other. Great for marriages here, great for churches. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. And like I said, I have seen this happen in the church. Maybe not food. 
I've seen it happen. I've seen people stop attending church service because someone said something about what they wore or where they sat or what their view was on something. And somebody said something, and their weaker brother, maybe a younger Christian, maybe not even a Christian, maybe just a visitor, first time attender. And you can say the wrong thing so easy because we've been Christians for a long time, right? We know God's word. And sometimes we just better shut up. God will deal with them on it. Let's not talk to them about it. Remember, Jesus said when he, the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world, <laughs> right? So when I say brother, sister comes in here, the Holy Spirit will work on them in terms of what they do or say in church. Um, yeah, the Holy Spirit will convict the world on sin, righteousness, and judgment. So do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. <laughs> but look what he says in verse 20. All food is clean. Amen. But it's wrong for a man to eat anything, I would add, to say anything or whatever that causes someone else to stumble, right? So it's... Again, he's talking about food, but it could be talking about a lot of things. It's better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother to stumble. Why? Because of the principle of mutual edification. When we talk about Christians, we want to build one another up. We don't want to tear each other down. If we feel that there's sin in a brother or sister's life, it's a little bit different, but we still have to be careful. If we feel that they're in sin, but they don't think they're in sin because they feel under God they have the right to do that, I think you're better off to pray about it than to talk to him about it. Now, there is, a, there is that place for church discipline to go to your brother who's in sin and take two or three others you know, with you and so forth. We have that whole procedure in Scripture on moral matters. But these are doubtful matters, questionable matters, matters in which they may find some verses that support their view, though you think by and large it's probably a wrong view. We need to be careful about talking to them about it at all. I think it's time to pray about it and let the Spirit begin to work in them and see what God can do. It's really not our job to lecture one another. It is our job to preach the word of God and to share scripture. So if you're going to say anything at all, it would be to go to the word and point out some verses so that people know it's not just your opinion. Have you considered this verse, right? <laughs> and that has a different point of view than maybe what they say. So the principle of mutual edification is fairly obvious to so do what we can to build one another up. But here's the one I really want to take just a little bit of time with. The principle of individual ethics, number three. Individual ethics. I have to be careful because we do believe in universal ethics, amen? In other words, we believe in an ultimate standard of right and wrong. That standards of morality and decency do not change with the passing of time. We believe in, well, we're biblical absolutists, right? The scripture is absolutely true, and if the scripture is clear on it, Particularly, we talk about moral matters where there's no hedging, there's no halfway. It's, you know, some things are clearly wrong. Fornication in the scripture, I'm just wrong. It's, it's immoral. There's no weaker brother principle here, right? And so, you know, and that's an unacceptable position in modern society, by the way, isn't it? Very unacceptable. Very out of touch with today to be an absolutist in your opinions on moral matters. That's just not contemporary. And you're really old fashioned. You're just a Bible thumper to think that way. <laughs> but that is what the scripture insists upon, doesn't it? That, that, that it, there is an absolute standard. So I'm not saying that. The principle of individual ethics refers to minor matters. There are minor matters. There are things that are of little consequence in the kingdom of God. I've heard of churches splitting over the color of the carpet. That's not right. That's Satan getting into a church. Somebody has to give in and say, okay, that's why I'll, I'll go with the gray. <laughs> you know? But individual ethics. So let's see if you see this. I want us to go back to verse 14. As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. That's individual ethics, isn't it? For him... It's a sin to eat that, but not for you. So what this says to us is that you can make your own sin. Amen? In essence. For you, you make it a sin because your mind tells you it's wrong. Then don't have it by all means. Don't, be, don't let somebody twist your arm and say that it's fine. Oh, no, it's not right. No, your conscience and your God and the word of God to you is saying, don't do that. Don't say that. And so you've got to stay true to that. If anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. You know, I thought of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident. 
that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And those rights, though they're universal, are individual. Because the pursuit of happiness is done each individually. This is an American principle. You can do what you want. And that, that is as American as apple pie for sure. But if anyone regards something as unclean, for him it is unclean. Um, new living on that. If someone believes it is wrong, then for that person it is wrong. Though for someone else it's not. For you and in your mind it's morally wrong. So again, you can put it this way, you can make your own sin. And it's fine to do so because when you make your own sin, so to speak, you're setting up parameters around your life that you think are right for you, and they are right for you. And you're wise to set them up. You won't go that far. Marsha and I were talking this morning about gambling. It's an issue. There's different views on it, right? Because one person says, well, what's the harm? You know, it gives a person a little bit of hope. You know, 50 cents, a dollar, buy a lottery ticket. Who cares? I mean, at least they're thinking, you know, maybe somebody else over here says, well, that gets you into a whole realm of sin. That's covetousness. Two different, completely different points of view. You know, so which is right? Well, just be fully convinced in your own mind. That's what matters. If you want to put a hedge around yourself and say no gambling, I think it's wrong, I don't want to go down that road, then that's great. And, and don't violate your own conscience. Don't buy a lottery ticket because you're just going to feel guilty about it. <laughs> and someone else has no problem with it. Yeah, you know. New Hampshire leads the way in gambling, by the way, right? First, first state to initiate the lottery. I'd say, one thing I would say about gambling is be very careful about getting into that. You, you really may not want to get into that at all. <laughs> I don't recommend it. Just another sin you can get caught. Eventually it can become sin, right? Because like it, it can be addictive. And eventually it can take away your fortune, you know, whatever little fortune you have. But you can make your own sin. Verse 22, whatever you believe about these things, I like this, keep between yourself and God. <laughs> All right, so you have strong views that you think Santa Claus is wrong for kids today. Fine, but keep your views to yourself. <laughs> maybe, I mean, maybe verse 22 is a verse you'd want to think about when your grandkids are sitting on Santa Claus's lap at the mall and you're cringing because Christians have different views, right? Have your own view and, and you're entitled to it and God bless you for it. But if you regard it as unclean and you don't want to fear family, then that's okay too. That's up to you, right? Dads, moms, it's up to you to work with your kids on it. And I, I really think that is a good illustration here. Easter eggs is another one, right? Maybe that's a little more innocent. What's wrong with Easter eggs? <laughs> on the other hand, it's pagan. How about in the middle? That's where I want to be probably on that one, right? My grandkids have Easter eggs. It's okay with me. But if they come to my house, they're probably not going to get any, <laughs> you know? But I'm not going to lecture my son about you shouldn't be doing that with your kids because they're his kids, not mine, right? So those are the kinds of things. But I like verse 22. Blessed is a man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. So the principle of individual ethics. And there's something that runs through this chapter as we wrap it up that is Maybe we're not thinking about it as clearly there, and that is that we each have a strong relationship with the Lord. It's implied. If you're going to have individual ethics, what is implied is that you have a strong walk with Christ. You know his word. You're searching his word. You're searching in prayer for what's right for you and what's right for your family. And God is helping you to make the tough decisions on some of these issues. You may be the type of person that wants to have more protection around your life. And others can live with a little more freedom. And we're all different, aren't we? We're like those animals on Animal Planet. All different kinds of animals in God's world. All different kinds of critters in the church. You know, I think that the church today does not tend toward legalism. And that's probably not our problem in the modern church. And maybe that's not always that good. I'm not a legalist and I don't believe in it. But on the other hand, if we go too far the other way, we become liberal. And that's even more dangerous than being a little too legalistic. And, well, you know, so it depends on the issues that you're talking about. But one last verse. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith. It's the last part here, though. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. 
Oh, yes, we're in the book of Romans, aren't we? And Paul comes back here, doesn't he, to that key word, faith. What were those key verses from chapter 1? I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. He comes back here to his overall theme. We are to live by faith and not condemn ourselves by going against our own faith. In other words, our own beliefs. We have our own beliefs. And let's stick with them. Because we're walking by faith. Let's not let somebody else convince us that something is right or wrong, but rather let's come before God and walk by faith and, and see what God reveals to us. Here's a few other issues I don't know if we talked about, like, like Bible versions can be controversial among Christians. And that's, we don't need to get into that, I think. You have your version, enjoy it, and praise God for it, you know. Uh, television shows that are appropriate for Christians. We could debate. I mean, different views. I mean, some will watch shows that I don't think that Marsha and I would watch, but I don't they don't stumble, maybe, you know, maybe they, you know, like the way I might over something that I saw. Uh, there's other issues. Uh, dancing used to be is not a big issue today. How about, though, when I talk about dancing, dancing in church? Because some churches are doing that. They have drama and dance. Some would be on this side. Some would be on that side, right? And there's going to be room for differences of opinion. Uh, used to be a major issue was working on Sunday. It's not even an issue anymore, is it? But it used to be in the church. Many Christians were very much against anything being open on Sunday or working on Sunday or having sports on Sunday. Today, with the church has kind of slid the other way, it seems. At least the culture has. But these are issues that may be minor or maybe not, but they're issues that we have to really think about and pray about to avoid offense. So did you get those three principles? Loving surrender, mutual edification, individual ethics. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the scripture, and it's a deep teaching. We know there's other passages we could look at in 1 Corinthians for your word there. But we don't want to do anything that causes our brother or sister to stumble, especially to stumble right out of church, out of fellowship in the body of Christ, and to be offended in such a way that they're no longer coming under the word of God no longer part of the body and using their spiritual gifts. We don't want people to stumble so far that they reject God even. And so we pray you would help us to build one another up, mutual edification to encourage one another, and to do what we can to encourage one another. Help us to know the difference between issues that are major, that we will not hedge on, and issues that are minor and are really not a concern in terms of the overall work of God. We thank you for our study in Jesus' name. Amen.